Business is going bad. COVID's wiped out a few business units. I've got a daughter that's dead. How do I explain that out to my family? How do I support my other daughter? And then a divorce thereafter. I don't know what the fuck to do now. And if you start to panic and you hit the overwhelm button, you become the victim. In today's episode, guys, we sit down with one of the top property educators here in Australia who is worth over $100 million and has nearly 2,000 properties. We cover so many things about what it takes to really create a wealthy life. You've got a net worth over $100 million. You are in your own helicopter. You've got the supercars. You've got thousands of properties, nearly 2,000 properties. It's no mystery. Success is no coincidence. So it's more about it. He shared secrets of the property game that helped him make over a million dollars in 30 days when he first started out. There's actually two answers to that one question. The first is, it's gotta be the people you surround yourself with. To bridge that gap, you won't have the credibility, you won't have the street smarts, you won't have the kudos, you won't have the capital. It's about who you associate with, but it's also too. And plus went deep into some of the unconscious things, the habits, the behaviors of billionaires. You're not gonna get a chance to sit in front of a billionaire if you've got nothing to show up with. The best way to do that is develop value in you, because then it's an equal exchange. So when you think about a wealthy person, what comes to mind? We sat down and covered an absolute masterclass on what it takes to become wealthy in more areas than just one. We're all looking for the easy way out. We're all looking for an answer. We're all looking for a pill. We're all looking for rich without the work. But fuck, sometimes you just got to double down and just see shit through. Do you guys are in for a freaking treat. And if you're brand new to this channel, I want to welcome you to the Dream Out Loud podcast. We put out episodes every single week to help you learn the skill set and the mindset to create your dream life. Do you want to be a billionaire? No. Why not? I've looked at that hard, you know. The curve up is an enormous amount of sacrifice. Welcome back to Dream Nation. Now let's get into this interview with the one and only Mr. Mark Rolton. Mark Rolton, so excited to have you on the podcast, my man. I want to dive right into it. So you've got a net worth over $100 million. You own your own helicopter. You've got mm -hmm. the supercars. You've got thousands of properties, nearly 2,000 properties. You've got a beautiful daughter. Some would probably look at your life and say you've made it. Some would say you've created a lot of wealth. Uh, and that's what this whole episode is going to kind of be about. So what can people expect to get from this episode? Why should they really hang around and listen to everything we're going to talk about? Great question. I'd probably respond with some deep insights as to maybe the hallmarks of what we all need. Mm. It's no mystery. Success is no coincidence. So it's more about, I think, looking at, you know, what's, what's helped you, you know, what has been, I suppose, the, the DNA of you being able to succeed. Yeah. That's what they'll get. They'll get the key points. Cool. So when I was putting together this whole thing of everything yeah. I want to sort of go away, uh, go through today, and I was mm. reading through your bio, one thing that really stood out, and I want to kind of get into this first before we dive into all your accolades, that how you've done things, is the last four years of your life seem to have probably been, when I was reading it, probably the hardest years of your life. For sure. Would that be safe to say? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Would you mind telling the listeners a little bit so they get a bit of a backstory about who you are, what the last sort of four years have been like for you? It's an interesting point to begin. So, yeah, look, I think we all go through challenges, TJ. It's no secret. I think that makes us who we are. It hones the finer edges but yeah, the last four years have certainly proven to be difficult. You know, we had COVID in there. That sort of sent a lot of our business units into a spin, as a lot of people had. It was about adapting. It was about sort of pivoting quickly. COVID really made a mess of a few of our businesses. So, yeah, it was just reeling from that experience. Um, I lost a baby girl, you know, probably two, three months into uh, COVID. That was hard. So you've got business in a complete state of foray. You know, you've got the family unit breaking down. A little baby girl only lived five days. And then I think about September of 20, my wife announced a divorce. So it's all coming at you pretty thick and fast. Um, but I think that you and I, deep within us all, have the answers. I think sometimes we get a little bit precious and a little fragile and we listen to a story that wants to make it easy. The best of you and I is found at the line. It's never safe. The line, what's the line? 
or the line. It could be the edge. It could be the cliff. The best of us is found at the edge, at that line. The best of us. Mm. So there was a lot of deep thinking, a lot of sleepless nights. And, uh, you know, that divorce, that became quite a challenge, you know. It was $300,000 a month of legal fees every month. It was um, 80, 120 emails a day. It was constant. So, you know, yeah, I think, I think today we're all looking for the easy way out. We're all looking for an answer. We're all looking for a pill. We're all looking for rich, you know, without the work. And I'm all about intelligence and being effective and resourceful. But fuck, sometimes you just got to double down and just see shit through. Mm. There is no secret to it, you know. What I, what I want to know is how you got through that, really. Because it's like everybody went through COVID and there's still people, there's people still now complaining about COVID. Oh, COVID. Yeah, sure. Right. And so everybody went through that. Mm. You had one of the most horrific things that probably anyone could ever ask for. Mm. And then what sounds like one of the most craziest divorces in the midst of business and what actually kept you going As, except for even though it sounds like a dumb question because obviously it's like well if i don't things are gonna fucking collapse so you've got to but yeah. how did you actually mentally keep yourself okay through that and and get through it in a way without you know having a nervous breakdown or just mm. you know how did you get through all that well i think probably one of the things that came to mind when you said that was more about assigning things to silos you know like if it's business it's business if it's family and home and reeling from the experience of a death of my daughter, that's in a different silo. Um, if it's about, you know, uh, relationships and them sort of falling apart and divorce, that's in a different silo. But I think human nature, we tend to stack things. When shit goes wrong and it really gets tough, we, we tend to sort of, you know, group them all together. And my life is bad because, and we start from the fucking top. And that doesn't mm. help us. You know, keeping those things sort of separate and in their place allowed, well, it certainly allowed me to continue and forge on. You know, business was one thing. Um, yeah, it was, it was tough because COVID, you know, being in the accommodation space, retirement villages, home parks, you had a lot of difficulties trying to make money when the government didn't even know what they wanted to do next. So you were trying to guess what was going to happen. And meanwhile, you know, you've got you know, thousands of people that you're taking care of and it didn't work very well. So, but I'd have to come home and recognise it's 6, 7 p.m. And now I'm dealing with, you know, the revelation that, you know, there's some trouble in the home. Mm. Silos. If I start to stack it, it'd become overwhelming. For the person watching this right now who's going through their version of yeah. the hardest time of their life, what's the most important thing they need to focus on or what's the most important thing they need to make sure they don't do to actually make sure they can mm. tell a story in a year of yeah. how they survived it? It's a great question, man. I would say, you know, firstly, do not stack it. You know, if you start to panic and you hit the overwhelm button and then you become the victim, you know, business is going bad, COVID's wiped out a few business units, you know, I've got a daughter that's dead, uh, I don't know what the fuck to do now. Um... How do I explain that out to my family? How do I support my other daughter, my wife in the process? And then a divorce thereafter. It's very easy to sort of find overwhelm. So going back to your question, what can they do? Yeah, just don't stack it. And I'd also say, like, have a bit of a vision for each one of those silos. Where's this going to be in six months? What am I shooting towards? Mm. You know, you just don't want to be caught in the chaos. That doesn't help anybody. You know, what's the end target? Where am I going to be? six months, 12 months from now, in that silo, this silo, this silo. And I think that allows you and I to drill in and become more focused and more discerning. Um, I was recently reading Extreme Ownership, I think it's called. Yeah. Jocko Winnick's book. And I think he starts by saying, it's like extreme ownership, taking extreme ownership of but every single person. And I'd like to know your perspective on this because for me, I, I take extreme ownership, responsibility of everything that happens. And... Okay it's really fucking annoying actually because it's so easy to be like, well, it's someone else's fault. Yeah. It's so, it's so easy and it makes us feel better. Yeah. And, but I, I really hate it for two reasons because if the problem happens, let's say in the business, yeah. first I have to take responsibility and say, well, fuck, there's a problem. 
that's that already sucks. And now I have to admit that I caused it somehow. Yeah. That sucks even more. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, that's kind of the only way what I've found to actually work through it as well, to take responsibility and sort of objectively look through this. Is that something that, you know, it could be a dumb question because I would assume you probably do do that, but you've got multiple businesses. Well, I just want to try and get the mindset. Like when something shit hits the fan, what's the sort of the first thing you sort of say to yourself or you think about the situation yeah. to approach it from a quite calm manner? Yeah, you're right. I think ownership is the first and don't be the victim second. You know, somebody said to me actually, um, which is actually quite pertinent that we discuss this now, when my little girl passed away, it was kind of strange. I was really, really angry, as you can imagine. A lot of people don't want kids. I love kids. Um, and it became, you know, a bit of a sore point for me. I was very fucking angry. And a buddy of mine pulled me aside one day and he said, look, life happens for you, not to you. He said, where's the great in this? And I honestly, mm. I wanted to pu- punch it's the It's a hard question out. to ask someone at that time. If he hadn't have been a friend, I mean, honestly, <laughs> you'd fucking clean him up. It really hurt, but it dug deep and it made me think. So I guess relating to your question now is, you know, where's the good in this? You know, where, where can I win in this? What did you get from that question? Yeah. 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 The hard answers. I think that you and I have an enormous amount of tenacity. There is an untapped well of belief in character but within us all. Mm. Mm. So going back, right, relating that to your question, it's more about, you know, how do I win? How do I benefit from this? Where's the gain? Where's the win in this? You know, it's not a case of um, this is all too hard, you know, or, or it's someone else's fault. I think as leaders, and that's what you and I are as mm. entrepreneurs, we're fucking leaders first. You know, what part of this can I win from? And you get this a lot. You know, I don't know your line of work explicitly, but I've got a sense of it. And you'll have a lot of people say it can't be done. I work at the front line with a lot of councils, a lot of bureaucracy, and development approvals get rejected all the time. And I'm always asking myself, where's the win? Where's the gain? This is happening for me. Okay, how do I assess this? Where's the margin? Where's the profit? Where's the gain? Mm. And if I can retool and adapt, the council's more likely to be on my side. So... There's a care, yeah, a, a, a caution. You know, don't become the victim. Be a part of the solution. Yeah, <clears throat> comes down to the questions we ask, right? Indeed. It's like questions will determine the things we focus on. It's funny. I was in New Zealand a couple of weeks ago, and so we run a lot of different events. I run a leadership program actually next weekend is our next one, and um, I've seen it. We uh, we we run another program with my business partner, Mind and Money. It's all about money and the mind. And we're in New Zealand together. And what we said to each other after the last event, we we're like, we need to actually, because we've only run it two times. This is the third time we did it. Like we need to put all this knowledge into a proper work booklet. Like let's level up this event. Let's create a sick work booklet. And we're sitting in New Zealand 10 days before the next event. And we're like, shit, we didn't do that thing we said we we're going to do. Mm. And I was like, do you reckon we could do it before the event? And we're like thinking, dude, we're going to write a whole program, mm. Mm. get it edited, get it printed by the weekend. And I yeah. go, no, it just can't be done. Yeah. And as the words came out of my mouth, <laughs> I was like, ah. And then I said to him, I said, how could we get it done though? Yeah. If we were going to do it, how would we do it? Yeah. And then we're both like, well, let's just start. I said, I'm going to start today. I start on the airplane yeah. and I started drafting all these things. And I sent him the live documents. So we could start editing at the same time. And we're both editing this thing. It got done that night. Incredible. We got off to our team. They edited yeah. the entire thing. The next day we got off to print and, uh, and Maddie went and picked them up the morning of the event. <laughs> Terrific. And I'm like, fuck, man. I just got to remind, remind myself still because naturally our, our brains are always going to want to go to the reasons why it can't work. Of course. It's easier. That's it's the comfort. natural default. That's the way we're wired, sadly, huh? Mm. So, so, like we've, so we've got to like be so at guard. I think Jim Brown said, be guard, you know, you stand at guard of your mind, right? right? Of Absolutely. things that people are trying to put in and, um, when I was watching some of your content, I, I, was, I was watching some of it and it seems like a lot of what you have done or what you do do has come from a sense to sort of prove that it can be done to someone or some people in the past. Is that a fair judgment? Absolutely. On what, point. T- tell me about it. What? what yeah, tell me about the, the past, the people. I'm assuming there was probably people, you've got a story of people who said you couldn't do it, can't yeah. be done, yeah. and now you've, you're crushing it. So... Well, I think when you, someone says it can't be done, it's like nuclear nuclear energy. It can be used for good, right, in small doses. 
And I remember distinctly standing in line, grade nine, a graphics teacher said to me, you'll never amount to nothing. They're the best motivators, yeah. aren't they? <laughs> Leo Muller was his name, was the teacher, Mr. Muller, right? <laughs> and we were all just rat bags, just a boys' class. There's probably 30 of us, public school. I mean, a shocking area of Australia, I won't say. But just, <laughs> you know, it was just no, there was no structure, no decorum at all. Everyone just ran over the teachers. And he just looked at me in the, in the queue and he just said, look, you'll never amount to nothing. And I remember taking that on board going, really, we'll see. We'll just see. You knew back then? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think I did. Yeah. Something in me was like, you can't say that to somebody mm. and not expect them to react. So I used that. And then all the way through my early business career, <coughs> excuse me, through my early business career, there was a lot of, you would call them, not colleagues, but certainly associates, friends, not friends, but sort of distance. Acquaintances. Acquaintances that always had criticism, that would always speak behind your back. And I actually really found that quite useful as fuel. Mm. You go to a barbecue with a stack of mates and there he is again. There's Johnny, you know, or, or there's Ian. And I just knew their whole persona, the tonality towards me was just so judgmental. And that became a force for me. It was like, mm. I will show you, you watch. Tell me it can't be done and I'll fucking make it happen. And it, the more and more I captured, you know, their comments, their feedback, the more it would drive me. The more I'd sit and think. And be like, yeah, okay, I've got a plan for that. I'm going to do this. It would really, you got no idea. It fueled a passion deep within me. It just stoked a fire. I remember I, I went to a friend's engagement party. When mm. I, I started my first business at 21. <clears throat> and I started a network marketing business at 21. So of all businesses to start, the one that cops the most shit from people. And I remember at this engagement party, everybody on the surface would be like, oh, friends of me and mm. whatever. Mm. After 10, 12 drinks in, and then a few people left the party and there was just a smaller group left. It's, uh -huh. like, it's like they all said, okay, now's the time. <laughs> and each of them just started yeah. to absolutely fucking rip into me. Be like, you're a fucking idiot. What do you think you are? Oh, yeah. this, it's like pyramid scheme and all these things. And I remember sitting there yeah. quite drunk actually, being like <laughs> watching all my friends and go like, okay. First, first decision I made was, this is the last fucking time I hang out with any of you. Yeah. And the next one was, yeah. I'm going to make sure I make millions of dollars and I'm going to make sure I stay friends on social media with all of you. Yeah. So you fucking watch the journey as well. Yeah. Nice. And it's like, I was talking with a friend yesterday actually about the leap from the world of black and white. This is how I refer to it. The world of black and white is what mm -hmm. we grew up in is what we're, we're used to. Yeah. Then one day, maybe a mentor, maybe whatever. We're aware. It's like a sign. It says, Hey, peek over this fence. Yeah. And I look over the fence and it's a world of black of color. Yeah. And I'm like, and I started to try to convince everybody, black and white, guys, it's color, it's color, it's color. And they're like, you're a fucking idiot. To no avail. Of course. All right. And um, they like black and white. For, for what I realized was I never really went anywhere until yeah. I wasn't afraid to actually let go of the black and white land. Because I was uh -huh. still holding on to this fence, one leg over, one leg back on the other side saying like, mm. come on, you guys can come too. We can yeah. all do this. Wake up, wake up. Yeah. And what I realized was it wasn't until I actually let go mm. and fully jumped into the world of color. And let, the, the further I got in, the less I could hear them. The further I got in, the more colorful my life got. Mm. Um, Great I, metaphor. Yeah. And I, I think everybody kind of goes through mm -hmm. that, that period. I remember, who, who is it? Chris Williamson, I think. He calls it the lonely chapter. Yeah, right. It's yeah. like a chapter of yeah. going through that period where all your current friends, mm. you don't fit in with them anymore. Mm -hmm. but you're not a big fish yet to fit in at the new table. Yeah. And you've got to get through that. Yeah. I've heard similar analogies, yeah. Well, what's your advice for people? Because we, we started talking before we were recording. You started saying that, like, mm. people really need this boldness. They need that, I guess, that internal grit to really get through those hard yards. How, how does somebody get through that that world from leaving one table to the next table when they're maybe just back of themselves? Yeah, it's super. There's actually two answers to that one question. The first is it's got to be the people you surround yourself with. You know, to bridge that gap, you won't have the credibility, you won't have the, tr the street smarts, you won't have the kudos, you won't have the capital. It's about who you associate with. But it's also to hang on to a strong vision. There's two parts. If I look at the early parts of my career, there were some mentors, but there wasn't any one singular person. You know, I'd sit with a billionaire one day and he'd be like, you've got to do this. And I'd sit with another guy and be saying, do this. And then I'd sit with someone else and be questioning, 
you know, the, the, the motive or the mandate of my portfolio. What are you trying to achieve, you know? So there was an array of feedback, live feedback, which was essential. But there was also, too, to have a vision within me to say, that's where we're going. Mm. That's where we're, we're going to end up at the, other, at the other side. And then you needed to be able to enroll the team with that vision. So I think your lonely chapter is, yeah, the people along that way, you've got to be cautious that you pull them in that are doing better than you, but also have a vision too. How do you go about finding these people? Great question. The right people to learn from. I get that all the time. You know, people sort of think, oh, I don't have those connections. Go find them. The best way to do that is develop value in you because mm. then it's an equal exchange. You're not going to get a chance to sit in front of a billionaire if you've got nothing to show up with. They're not going to give you the fucking time of day, right? Did you ever think in your head, like you're sit- on your come up, you're sitting down across from a billionaire, did you ever, the imposter syndrome kick in and be like, what the fuck have I got to give this guy? Did that ever creep in? Of course it did. Absolutely. But there'd be something. You know, how many times, I've sat with eight or nine billionaires now, you know, from textiles to IT, you know, to property, to even simple things like resources, you know. But there's always something to offer. When you're your authentic self and you are well-read, well-versed, when you've sort of sat across the table from somebody um, of that status, mm-hmm. you have something to give, be assured. But you've got to do the work. It's not just show up and hope for the best, fingers crossed. She might have a great idea or an insight into my business. It doesn't work that way. There's got to be something on offer. So I'd always show up. And I remember one day a billionaire sat across the table and he said, what do you do? And I said, I'm in affordable housing, manufactured home parks. And he looked at me. He looked at his lawyer and he says, are we in that? <laughs> and his lawyer said, no. And he was like 75, 77 at the time. And he goes, why the fuck aren't we? <laughs> and I remember saying that. And he was giving this guy Alex a hard time. And I'm like, Cool. And he just drilled me. Mm. Billionaire. He said, what are you doing? I said, nothing. He goes, you want to do lunch with me? I said, absolutely. We're on the 18th floor. He owns the whole fucking tower and everything downstairs. We sat in the cafe restaurant and his PA is across the table keeping his wine glass topped up. And he just nailed me for another 90 minutes. How does that work? Why does that do that? Land lease. How does that work? So when you sell this, you do this. What's that worth then? What's the cap rate of that? He was on it. So there was something for me to be able to offer. And that fostered a fantastic relationship because mm. he was smashing it in other areas that I was just not skilled at. But I could liaise with him. Now I could refer to him. Now I could ask his for his opinion, his counsel. Yeah. Do you want to be a billionaire? No. Why not? Oh, I've looked at that hard. You know, the curve up is an enormous amount of sacrifice. You know, I th- sort of think the range between about 100 and 400 mil It's certainly achievable, but it's not at the expense of a whole lot of other things in life. Just my own opinion. Yeah. Everyone has different visions, you know. I, uh, family is my number one value, by far. And I find it very, very hard. I see people in that realm that have really got an unbalanced, unworkable life. Mm -hmm. Um, They're on their third marriage sometimes, fourth, you know. It's not really the road path for me. But I honour people that do it. Yeah, it's it's good you're aware of that. I was at a mastermind uh, catch up literally last night, and one of the guys was like, "I'm like, well, he's having troubles in your business." And I said, well, "What's the goal this year?" He's like, "I want to get ten mil. That's what we want. Ten mil, ten mil a year. Rip. That's what I want." Um, yeah, and and I said, "Why?" He's like, "Well, it's just a good number." I'm like, mm. "What do you mean? Mm. I'm like a good number for what? Like." What profit margins? Oh, it doesn't matter. Just, I'm like, well, it does fucking matter. Of course it matters. A lot. I'm like, you know, I'm like, because, <clears throat> and, and then after about five minutes talking, he walked away going, actually, what I really want to do is just make 600K a year profit. Got it. I'm like, see, that's a far, that's far off 10 mil a year, bro. Yeah. Like building, you know, if you get 600K a year, good business education, business model, 50% profit margins, maybe that's a small business you go grow now. Yeah. Now from growing a 1.5 mil business to 10 yeah. is a significant amount of it is. sacrifice effort. And exposure, don't forget risk. Mm. To get to something that's doing 10 a year, that's, there's an element of risk there. Yeah. What, what else goes into, so when you think about a wealthy person, what comes to mind? A wealthy person in terms of what? Who they are? Your perspective. Makeup? Yeah. So if you, say, if you would say that person, from my opinion, is a very wealthy person. I'd have to know a little bit more because I don't make wealth as a measure. What I look for when I've got you know, good authentic friendships is money is not really a high priority for me. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at who they are. How do they show up as a father, as a mother? Who are they as a person? 
What are their credentials as a friend? Now, money can be a marker that just adds a little bit more, adds a little bit more sort of value to who they are because we have more commonality. Does that make sense? Yeah. But it's not the measure. Yeah. As I, I want to, so reason for my question was I'm sitting at a restaurant on the Gold Coast here one day uh, with my partner having a nice, it was like a nice steak restaurant and there's a guy over from us, really loud, kind of older, white hair, old, maybe in his 70s, my mm-hmm. guess. Mm-hmm. Drunk as, sitting there with his sugar baby and she's like a 21-year-old girl, she's drunk as, doing whatever. I'm like, have a fun night, sure. But then they came over to our table and he's like sitting down, he's super drunk and I'm like, all right, just just talking, just talking. And he starts to tell me, he's like, do you know who I am? I said, no, but I'm sure you're going to tell me. Uh-oh. He's like, you can Google me. And I'm not going to mention the other things we talked about because it would give away exactly who he was. But he was a billionaire and uh, he sold out of this company for a few billion dollars. And I'm like, fucking whoa. And I knew the company. And he's like, you know this company? I said, yes. He goes, yeah, I built that. I'm like, get fucked. Wow. Okay. Mm. And uh, I nearly lost for a moment because I was nearly like, wow, I should connect with this guy. I should go play golf with this guy or something. Mm. And then my gut was like, is that someone you want to model though? Mm -hmm. Spot on. Yeah. So I was like, here's this guy interrupting my date. (laughs) Yeah. Because he's drunk. Yeah. He's lonely. Yeah. And like, I didn't go send him love, but I was just, Morgan, is that someone you'd go and like, sure, I could probably learn things, of course, but I'm like, but at what cost could I pick up yeah. bad habits? So yeah. I look at people and I yeah. think social media skews it. Social yeah. media says, well, I've got a Rolex. I've got the Lambo. Do what I say. Yeah. And people get skewed yeah. because it's like this authority bias thing. Yeah. Like, wow, you've got the thing I want. I should listen to you. But there's a lot of shit advice from people that are like what their rented Lambo mm-hmm. saying you should do this. This is this. And yes. there's more to the pie, I believe, than just money. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, we share similar thoughts there. Mm. Totally agree. I think so many people today are fixated on social media. and It's so harmful. Yeah. I think it's important to define what you want to do, who you are, and then put the material objects beside that. Yeah. Start off with who before what. I was um, talking with Ty Lopez. We had him on the podcast a few weeks ago. And I'm like, I was asking him about like Illuminati and all this crazy shit on social yeah. media because he spent time in Hollywood. And, and he's like, man... He's like, the more time you spend on social media, the lower your IQ becomes. Yeah, it's so true. And I'm like, but you're the man. You're the social media man. He's like, yes. He's like, but I'm a drug dealer. Mm. He goes, I deal the drugs. <laughs> I don't take it. He's like, I deal the social media. He's like, I consume every 20 minutes a day. He's like, but the longer you spend on social media, the dumber you'll become. Yeah. He's like, just use it, yeah. build an audience, build the brand. That's it. But I, he's like, don't. That's don't consume it. Don't consume your own drugs. Yeah, yeah, wow. Yeah, like so we, we, yeah, but it's, it's so addictive. Um. Mm. But yeah, but one one thing I saw, so you made you you nearly went bankrupt at twenty two, mm. right? And which is wild, right? Like you you're already crushing it at such a young young age. But then you made a million dollars in thirty days from doing property options. Yeah, a million sixty six in thirty four days to be precise. Yeah. What are property options? How did that happen? What changed in that? A million and 66 in 34 days. What's up, Dream Nation? Have you ever wondered how far ahead your life would have already been if you had got access to this type of content at a younger age? Look, this is why I need your help. I'm trying to build the number one personal development platform out there to teach you guys the tips, tricks, and attitude of what it takes to live your dream life and to bring the type of education that we all wish we had in school. This show only grows by word of mouth and new subscribers. So it would mean the world to me if you could smash that subscribe button right now, leave us a five-star written review or drop a comment below and share this episode with a friend. I would be forever grateful. All right, now let's get back into this episode. Yeah. I lived in the States from 2002 to 2004. And over there, it was more of a process of, I don't want to buy it. I don't want to pay for it today, but I want to control it for a period of time. In that period of time, I want to force some value on that. I either want to get that block of flats and then strata title them, or I want to get a development approval on that raw block of land. Um, And that was the concept in America. That was very, very kind of common. So I just bought that idea back here and went, how can I utilize that? Mm. And then modified that to suit Australian laws. That took us a while. But yeah, I put together a deal. Um, Yeah, and I spoke to the vendors at length. There was two guys. They were in a bit of trouble. They owned a business, and they had to unload this asset. I had a DA, and it was useless, obviously. But they said to me, you'll get 54 townhouses on this property. It was in walking distance of a Woolworths. 
So it gives you some idea where it was. Um, and I just went straight to council and said, look, I don't own this. Can you help me out? She said, yeah, sure. And uh, she pulled the town plan across and flipped the screen around. <coughs> Excuse me. And she said, oh, you'll get about 93 townhouses on that. And I went, are you sure? She goes, oh, absolutely. We've changed all the zonings. Here's what will happen. Here's what you can do. This road widening, etc." And I looked at her and I went, right. And I had a builder, developer in my back pocket then that I knew quite well. He was quite a wealthy guy, young guy. And I rang him up and I said, listen, here's an opportunity. I make this, you make that. You'll make 8.2, I'll make a mill. What do you think? He goes, absolutely. And we sat at the cafe the next day. And he just looked at me in the eye and he said, that's fucking a great deal. That makes so much sense. He said, I'll make more than 8 million. He goes, I'll build it myself. And he said, don't talk to anybody about it. I said, done. The next morning, 10.30, he said, I'll take it. So it was a million sixty-six thousand bucks in 34 days. I did not own it. Yeah. And have the capital to buy it back then. So you just put the deal together, yeah. essentially. Yeah, and flicked it onto him. So he did very well out of it. One thing that I get from that is it takes a lot of balls to actually go like, I'm gonna, like, and we we're talking about this before the podcast started. You said one of the things that most people mm. need the most, that was a word you used, what was it? Brazen. Brazen. Talk to us about that. How has this been one of the things that you've used to really get deals done and mm. build this life you've got? Well, I think, you know, being brazen is just nothing more than backing yourself believing it can be done. If you don't believe in yourself, no one will. And I think that starts with a vision. I really do. You know, if you're willing enough and brave enough to sort of say, this is what I stand for. This is who I'm going to be. This is what I'm going to live. Here's how I'm going to, you know, live out or build out this life. I think if someone's brave enough and tenacious enough to do that, I think it gives them the belief that this can be done. Mm. And brazenness is just an extension of that. Now I know where I'm going and now I know who I want to be. What have I got to do to get there? And looking at deals like that, it just made sense. So it wasn't like rocket science. It was just I had someone that was willing to get rid of it at a discount. But I also had someone there that was more than willing to take it and knew, could see the, the value, could see the upside. Yeah. And brazenness was just gluing the two ends together, saying, fuck it, I'll put it together and see what happens. Mm. I knew nothing. I rang a lawyer and I said, look, this is not what I do. <laughs> I'm just fresh back to Australia. How would you glue this together? And he was very strategic. He said, yeah, it's an option. And he explained it to me over the telephone. He goes, yeah, you won't, you won't own it. He said, but you'll pass it through to the buyer and you'll make the difference in between. I said, great. So explain, <coughs> explain to us the option again. So you're just sourcing the deal. You sourced mm. land mm. from someone you want to sell it. Then you found somebody, a developer, who mm. wants to build it. And you're just like, but why wouldn't he just buy the land? Or did you already sort of? I've already secured it. Ah. It's like an option over a stock. Right. Share. No different. Yep. Identical process. That's amazing. Option to buy, option not to buy. Mm -hmm. A strike price, if I don't want it, I can pass it back. If I yep. do want to proceed, then it's at this cost. Yeah. I love it. So I was, I was looking on... Um, so I've I've been aware of you actually for a long time, actually. I, I think probably even before I started my first business because I started looking for how to get rich. Right. All right. And I think I, I attended, you know, property seminars, the, you know, all of the things. And then... Mm. So I've seen you pop up, you know, Mark Rolton property for like a while. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know why it's taken this long to finally get to meeting, <laughs> but um, what what I've seen is like you run education seminars, you run events, you've you've trained now. Like I saw you've created dozens and dozens and dozens of millionaires through your education. <clears throat> what I know is this: is two parts of success: mechanics, psychology, what actually drives us in between our ears, and then the know how to do it, the skill set. And because I'm in a similar thing, like I can give people tools mm. and only some people do it. Right. I've had some people say to me in the past, um, well, only 1% of people actually succeed at that. And I'm like, well, you're asking the one, wrong question. You should be asking, what do the 1% do that 99% don't do? Yeah. So what I want to know from you is, what, what has been some of the key characteristics you've seen in your students that have actually gone and become millionaires and killed it in life compared to the people who haven't? Mm. What's the difference? Yeah, it's a great question. I wish we could delineate a lot easier because then we'd know the formula to make more people more rich, <laughs> yes. right? Um, I would say desperation would, mm. be the, would be the largest majority. Would you agree? Desperation is when someone's backed into a corner, they've got no money, and it's like, I've got to make this work. They could be 25, 50. They could be 60. 
and sitting across the table going, this must fucking happen. What do I need to do? And I think it's that determination, that visceral determination in somebody that they can, they can smash it. I think that's the, dis- that's the difference. That's the deciding factor in my head. The pain. Yeah, because ultimately I had nothing. There was no sketchboard. There was no methodology. It was just like seller, buyer, maybe I can do a deal. And it went on for years. But now the, 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 the process that we use is so refined. It's so, you know, so clever technologically. Um, it's all there. The st- whole strategy is laid out. So it's so simple is what I'm saying. Yeah. But a lot of people don't engage, don't commit. And the deciding factor being, I've got to make this happen. Mm. You know, we've seen very unfortunate circumstances upon people where, you know, they're on the run, you know, from a partner with a DVO, two young children, no money, zero dollars, but being worth, you know, literally 6.1 million net. Wow. And that's all happened within the space of three years. And that's not unusual. You kind of go, oh, that's like, you know, the, the beachhead of the whole fucking operation. It's not. There's a commonality among them. And it's like when a business goes bad, there's a divorce. We had one guy that was a deregistered doctor. Just unfortunate. The guy fucking smashed it. Not because he's bright and intelligent, because he owed so much fucking money. And he was in a lot of trouble. So it's probably the circumstances. Mm. What prevail. I'm curious to know is, because the, the biggest thing we'll do anything to avoid feeling is pain. Mm-hmm. So you just said people who are mostly distressed, they're sitting on their nail, where it's like, this hurts so much, where it's like, okay, I've got two options. Keep doing what I've always done, but I'm in uh-huh. so much pain where it sucks, or here's my way out. Yeah. And they, they leverage towards that. But what I've seen is the paradox of that, eventually they get far enough off the nail where it doesn't hurt anymore. Yeah. And then they have a perception that they make up in their head that mm. continuing will be more painful than staying where I am, which mm. is quite often the case because it's more discomfort. Yeah. It's the fear of doing more. The f- and, and sometimes people get to a comfortable position but then the fear will kick in. Well, what if I lose it? What if I do the wrong deal? And then the paradox of pain that yeah. once got them going is the thing that immobilizes them now. That's and, good. Yeah. And what I'm curious to know is, because sometimes I'll even notice it myself, like, I, I really hustled for a lot. Mm. Made my first million by 28. And it's kind of like I did well, that. Yeah. And then the last couple of years, I've been like, well, obviously, I'm, I was just saying that before, I'm like a bit of a psychopath. Like we started another company this week and probably I'm going to look to do another partnership maybe next week or the week after. And for me, what keeps me going now is the game of it. It's mm. fun. But I don't work anywhere near as hard as what I used to. Like I don't have that because I don't need to. It's comfortable now. And what I'm curious is, how do you work now? Like, or how do you sort of, when you get to that level, when you're like, I don't have to work anymore. Like mm. things are set. Mm. What keeps you going to make sure you don't fall backwards or so you don't get complacent? How do you continually keep that grit and that determination? There's a few spokes to that question. Cause I must admit, you know, I've lost my way too. Mm. Um, when you've got money, there's a lot of distractions. You got a lot of time. Um, so yeah, I'm not exactly saying I'm a saint, but of recent I've found the same thing. Um, I would probably say, look, you know, as a man, I would have to suggest that there's something deep within us that needs to grow and stretch. Because if we're not growing, we're clearly dying. And the challenge with men is we become very, very stale. Um, and I say men, masculine, the masculine energy in a relationship. So well, I think we need to strive. We need to be, you know, empowered, better ourselves year on year. Or we lose an enormous amount of our, our identity, our DNA. Mm. We've got to strive. It's who we are. It's how we were built. It's our wiring. So there's a, that, to me, that's a very important factor of who we are. We need to honour that. Now, I think also as well, you know, passive income can be a, a, you know, can be a problem because when you understand how to create money, you don't go looking for active business anymore. You're looking for shit that's recurring. Yeah. And you get good at it, fucking good at it. It's like, I'm not doing that. I'm doing that. And then that business can really produce three, five, eight, ten million a year of just pure cash flow. Um, so you have to do less and less and less. So I think it's very important that, yeah, you and I look at who we are, our makeup, that I want to strive, stretch, grow. I need to be more. I need to feel that essence of change. But I also think that, you know, in a more material world, we need to have some things on the wall, some dots on the horizon. You know, I'm still shooting for things now. And I know that if they're not there, 
I become complacent, lazy. So I become a very goal. unmotivated. Absolutely. Absolutely. But just like you suggested earlier, you're in it for the game and the game's sake. Mm. It's not a measure anymore. And that's a nice place to be. That's a nice quality to harbour. Is I'm purely in it just to change the game, to shift shit up, you know, to inspire my team, to push this along, to see how far it can go before shit breaks. It's not about, you know, I've got this, I've got that, I've got this, you know. Mm. It, it's not really about the material markers, but I need something that inspires me. Does that make sense? Yes. The <clears throat> helicopter was one of those. Yeah. It was one of those. I mean, I could have bought it many years ago. And it's like, when I buy it, I want to have the time exclusive. It can take a year off to study to be a pilot. That's different. Yeah. That's okay. what you did? Yeah. And it's fucking hard. I, know. I mean, <laughs> they say a year. I mean, I reckon they're telling lies. It's yeah. like it's a year and a half and it's every day methodically. Uh. So now you've got all this business that's going on. You've got all this sort of head noise. But I've got to be completely removed so I can study. And some days that was like nine hours. I haven't studied for years. Yeah. I had a tutor at my home for four months straight. God. There's a lot. What, what, do you, what do you do with the helicopter? Like, where, where, where do you take it? Like, so you've, you've got this helicopter, oh. you park it at the airport, you've got all this freedom, you can just do whatever the fuck you want. Mm. How, do you, how do you best use that? Well, you throw a few mates in it and do a few fucking loops. Depends how, <laughs> depends how far detail we're going to get. Where, where like, cause it, can you land it anywhere? Like, what's the goal? Because that's yeah. also a goal for me. I'm like, I don't like flying. Mm. I'm a skydiver, so I want to jump out, but I don't yeah. want to fly the plane, but I love helicopters. I would love to get one of them to just shoot up to yeah. Tambourine or go yeah, to yeah. an island. or yeah. So, like, where, what do you do with a helicopter when you've just you got do a toy like that. that? You do all. You've got a lot, enormous amount of flexibility. You can get wherever you fucking like. <laughs> but, you know, the lunch with your partner kind of ends up being some kind of cool location. Yeah. Yeah. You know, where you land, they bring out lunch and a table and chairs, you know, becomes very exclusive. It's fun. Yeah. Um, there's an enormous amount of, there's an enormous amount of freedom that comes with it. Yeah. Mm. It's like when you remember getting maybe your, your license, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. that first week in the car was like, fuck, I, I can go anywhere. Yeah. It's that all over again, but it doesn't stop because there's no traffic. It's just like, I go anywhere I want. So it's, yeah, it's quite, it's quite nice. It's quite a, a, a Quite a luxury. How, how far can you travel on it? Like, what's the capacity before you've got to Depending fill up? On weight, obviously. But you're yeah. sort of talking somewhere around the 400 kilometres range. Four or five hundred. Wow, so what's that? You Say 400 to, kilometres. Get down to Coffs Harbour? Yeah. About that, six yeah, hours? One blast, that? yeah. That's all right, hey? So you can get all the way up to Hamilton Islands with a couple stops. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe Goals. We'll put that one on. <laughs> we'll put it on the board. Yes, yeah, so um, I think it's important. Going back to your, your previous question, it's important to have those markers on the horizon. I yes. think all great leaders do the same thing. But it's not just the things. It's who they're going to be as people. Yeah. They are the great leaders. They are the ones that stand the test of time. So my understanding is every single time we level up, right, is we almost have like this nervous system. We have to expand our nervous system to hold it hold everything that we're actually calling in as well i don't know if you've experienced that and i sort of explain to people it's like our financial thermostat if our financial thermostat set for donald trump is a perfect example was a billionaire mm. set for a billionaire bankrupt becomes mm. a billionaire again mm. like that's not that's just because in his psyche he's like no this is my level Got it. what's your advice to people that are actually wanting to expand because when we've we just had our biggest month ever last month and i was looking i'm like well that's pretty fucking gangster and I was like, I was just w feeling my body. I'm like, it feels interesting. Never made that much money in a month before. And I'm just like sort of like holding it, making sure I don't do dumb shit with it. Mm. Making, watching my brain and be like, oh, I just go and blow it. I'm like, no, I don't know if I can blow it. No. Invest it. Or no. I'm watching, you know, because we can get into this cycle mm. of sabotaging or because mm. we want it, we're, we're comfortable yeah. with a level. So yeah, how it. do we sort of expand our nervous system, our financial thermostat so we don't go backwards? That's a great question, man. You've got some fucking really good point of <laughs> questions. Again, I'll go back to the people. Mm. When you can't grow that thermostat, you've got to go find someone that's already there. Mm. That's easy to do. Particularly when you start to make some money and you've got some ideas and you've just done your best month ever. There's something to share. So you must lean into those that are already in that place. That's what happened with the helicopter. Yes. I started hanging out with guys who were like, oh, I've got this heli. I'm like, hmm. how far does that go? Oh, we do this, this, and this. Oh, we go camping in the heli. Oh, that sounds fucking cool. <laughs> Where? Alice Springs. Oh, how long does that take? Oh, three or four days. Cool. You take the kids? Yeah. I'm like, fuck. All right. Wow. 
So hanging out with those guys mm. just naturally pushes the thermostat. And again, you said before, you've just got to go find them. Yeah. Where do you find people like this? Well, you know, I get that question a bit too. Solicitors. Lawyers protect wealthy people. That's Tap a lawyer. Hey, and we'll know someone. Yeah. Tap a lawyer. Hey, who do you know? What's in your network? Is someone in the money lending space? Yeah, and mate, they've got 30, 50, 60 of these people. Net worth greater than 10. That's a great place to start. Mm. And they've always got one or two that are worth 100, 100 or better. How do you overwrite the imposter syndrome that's going, fuck, can I reach out to these people? Can I do this? Um, yeah, of course. I think that'll always be there. That sort of sense of, you know, do I have something of value for them in exchange? Mm. I think, you know, the human brain, we do doubt ourselves a lot. It just depends which voice is louder, the voice of doubt or the voice of belief. Mm. That's the game we always play, isn't it? There's that, that tale of two wolves. Have you heard that? Mm, I have. So Great two, metaphor. Two wolves, we've got the doubt or we've got the doubtful wolf or we've got the successful wolf. And like, mm. well, which one's going to win in your mind? Mm. Whichever one we feed. Whichever one's louder. Yeah. Which sure so one's got the most juice. That'll never stop. And that's a good thing because I think what it does, it, it, it challenges us every day internally. It says, yes. which one I'm going to listen to? Which one I feed? Which <coughs> one do I decide to feed? And it's like the gym. It's just every single day. They become stronger and stronger, right? I, you know, I, I have a new interpretation of it. So last year I got flown to the UK to speak at the largest fitness event in the world yeah. alongside Stephen Bartlett, Dyer of CEO. Chris Williamson and and the founder of the company called Grenade. He's a billion a billion dollar company, billion dollars Australian. Okay. They're doing like over half a half a million, so half a billion pounds a year. And I got hit up the day before because I, I thought I was just going to, to sort of like be a support, like talk on a panel or something. So I was like, hey, look, anywhere I can support, I'm just grateful for the opportunity. This right. is amazing. Yeah. Well done. And the host calls me the day before. He's like, oh, what time do you get in tomorrow? I said, oh, I'll be there, you know, right at the start. Come watch the whole day. He's like, great. He's like, we're putting you um, after Stephen Bartlett, after James Smith, after this grenade guy, the billionaire, and right before Chris Williamson, okay? That's where you're in. So bring the energy. It's opening day. And I'm like, got it. <laughs> like, wow. And he's like, yeah, keynote. He's like, you're 40 wow. minutes. I'm like, fuck, all right. And um, so I get there. And in the day, I'm obviously just like shitting bricks because when you're the last talk of the day, you're like, fuck, you're just thinking all day long. Uh -huh. Stephen Bartlett's there. James Smith, Chris Williams, and all these people, and we're sitting in the green room talking, mm. and I'm talking with these people that I watch on social media. Mm. These Stephen was with the Prince of the UK the day before, and and I'm like, talk about imposter syndrome kicking in. Yeah, I'm like, what the fuck is yeah. some Australian kid doing here yeah. Yeah. about to talk after these people? Yeah. And I'm just witnessing the thoughts in my head. I'm like, this feels yeah. so weird, yeah. and, my, and my body's like, like stretching out of its skin almost. <laughs> yeah. And I was walking up the stairs after leaving the green room, just thinking, like, shake my head, being like, this is fucking wild. I'm like, and mm. then thinking, like, I, I don't know if I should be in the green room. Mm. And that's when it hit me. I'm like, if you don't have moments like that, mm. you're not moving the needle. Yeah. If, if I'm just used to being like, oh, this is normal, yeah. I'm not moving the needle hard enough. The fact that someone saw more in me than what I saw in myself at the time that's good. And invited me to be over there, put me in a position to be like, fuck, I feel like I'm an imposter. Uh-huh. Re reframed in my mind I'm like that's exactly how you know that you're on the right track Indeed. so I now seek huge discomfort I actually seek the I want to feel like I shouldn't be here as yeah. often as possible because mm. that means that I'm actually leveling up that's great so it's I, I agree I don't think it will ever well said it'll never go away well said mm. if you were to start all over again today mm. no money mm. but everything your tenacity your mm. mindset mm. Um, no network, mm. what would you do? Start with a plan. A piece of paper. Just where do I want to get to? Who do I want to be? Would it be a financial goal? Would it be a certain vehicle you'd focus on? Or Yeah. It'd be a financial goal because mm -hmm. that brings out the best, as you referred to. It's the game that makes us who we are. Mm. So it'd be a financial goal for sure. The vehicle think? of choice. Mm -hmm. mm. I'd look at some alternatives to what I've done. You wouldn't do property again? No. Why? I'd change it up for the sake of challenge. Okay. Yeah. Would not repeat it, no. What do you... What There's do been you a lot of risk. There's been a lot of risk along the way. Yeah. You know, it's... Uh, it's You know, you've got to have a strong appetite for risk. And I don't know. I, I would seriously consider other methods, yeah. What do you think is like the new... 
the hot thing. Like if you were to fully start over again, you're like, if I was going to bet all on this one niche or industry healthcare. or healthcare. No fucking question. Look at the aging population of every nation across the planet. And the demographic between 60 and 85 is growing so fast and no government wants to take responsibility. That's the greatest opportunity of our time. Mm. Mark, this has been epic, man. <laughs> uh, where can everybody find you on social media? <laughs> Instagram Mark Rolton there you go <laughs> I'm high tech man I love it we'll put all the links in below anyway for you um, but a final question to wrap this up yeah. if you were to go back to your 18 year old self yeah. and give him 30 seconds of advice what yeah. would it be Ooh, I've never had that question 30 seconds at 18 yeah believe it can be done 